He was the fo founder, executive director of the Planetary Society for over three decades. Uh, I introduce to you Dr. Lewis Friedman. Thanks, Bruce. It's, it's great to be here as a spectator. I, you know, usually I was working, but now this is really great. I, uh, I first of all want to commend everybody for coming out, commend everybody who's uh, putting this on. And I want to take a minute before I do the Ray uh, Bradbury tribute to say something that I disagree with from yesterday's uh, panel discussion at the radio show. Somebody asked, it was actually a good friend of mine that asked in the audience, uh, why don't we take risk anymore? When did Americans become adverse to risk? And we were um, complaining, as I always do, about the status of the program, why aren't we doing bigger and bigger and better things. But you know, you think about it, look at the risk we took at taking tonight. Uh, and you know, we're not risk averse. These are the great things that are done, and it's NASA that's doing them, it's JPL that's doing them, it's Planetary Society that's, that's being part of it. Um, so I, I, I think uh, maybe a look at the present and then getting away from it a little distance, we realize that we are taking great risks and we're doing great things. And, and I want to, you know, Scott Hubbard talked about his, his role in the program decisions. Uh, these were risky program decisions. Some of them have failed, will fail, and, and they're not the wrong decisions because they did that. That is what we do, and that's what we do in the space program, and it represents not just a great symbol for America, but a, re a symbol for the world. I also want to commend the Planetary Society, us, ourselves, uh, the risk of that crazy party last night, gee. I, I would never have done that. I found Bill, I was, if he's in the audience. Kudos to you. It was a great party, a uh, great event, and we're bringing in new people, uh, and I think it, it's really a delight to, to be part of that. Now, does that connect to the Ray Bradbury uh, tribute that I want to do? It does, because Ray's essential message was always about taking risk and doing great things and trying it. And, and, and I'm going to be referring to that several times in, uh, in this uh, short tribute. First of all, I'm very honored that, uh, that I knew Ray Bradbury. Uh, honored not because uh, I like to hang around with celebrities or that it somehow elevated uh, uh, anything I was doing, but that Ray was an inspiration to me before I ever even got into this business. And Ray was an inspiration to millions and millions of people around the world to whom we connected with in all our efforts uh, in space exploration. He was a symbol of, of, of great exploration and of global interest in, in space exploration. He was known everywhere in the world. He, to me, symbolized uh, what is now the motto of the Planetary Society, fostering a global culture that explores other worlds and understands and protects our own. Uh, now, it's ironic in a way that we think of Ray as, as that symbol, because Ray wasn't the classical kind of explorer. In fact, pretty much preferred to stay at home. A long time, he wouldn't go anywhere, and then he wouldn't fly, and he, you know, it was hard sometimes to, to, uh, to, to get him to go places. And also, um, his, his work uh, is kind of strange, too. It wasn't always uh, about the joy of exploration that came through. But there was a lot of gloominess in it. There was a lot of scary stuff in what Ray wrote, and sometimes uh, dark. So it's a little ironic to think of him as the symbol of exploration. But it may be ironic, but it's not wrong. Uh, he, he actually motivated the whole idea about, of, of exploration and created what I think was the essential mes message of it. It was a sign of optimism for the future. He took us to new worlds. He suggested that we can and do something about all of anything we ever encountered and that we should strive, overcome the naysayers, of which there were plenty, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in carrying out exploration. I first saw Ray at a panel, which I think was referred to yesterday, uh, called Mars in the Mind of Man, out here in 1971. Uh, for those of you who remember the previous century. Uh, it was at Caltech, and he was together with Arthur Clarke, Bruce Murray, Carl Sagan, and Walter Sullivan, who is the, the latter was the leading science writer, uh, journalist in the country at the time. He was writing for the New York Times. And 
they had a discussion called, you know, what, what's the importance of Mars in, in, in exploration? And he read a poem which he said represented for him why he writes science fiction and summarized, I think, his views on why we do space exploration. I, this is Ray's words. I send my rockets forth between my ears, hoping an inch of will is worth a pound of years, aching to hear a voice cry back along the universal mall. We've reached Alpha Centauri. We're tall, oh God, we're tall. That theme of standing tall comes up a lot, and I'll be referring to it a couple of other times in, in things Ray wrote. I always found it a curious illusion. I mean, when I think of what we do, I don't, you know, the we're standing tall, but it fits right away with the, uh, the famous quotation of, uh, of Robert Browning, a man's reach should exceed his grasp. It's what, it, it's what Ray was saying with that standing tall illusion. Um, that, other, that same night at the uh, 1971 uh, symposium, Ray said, you know, he was talking to the panel. This was in the panel part of the discussion. He said, I hope the Martians are up there waiting for us. In fact, I hope they're waving signs which say, Bradbury was right. <laughs> Let's take a look at that video from that uh, 1971 symposium. See that last line in there, the, the again, the, the taller uh, metaphor. I don't know what in hell I'm doing here. Uh, I'm the least scientific of all the people up on the platform here today. Um, Nine-year-old boys are always finding me out. <laughs> <laughs> A 10-year-old boy a few years ago ran up to me and he said, is that Mr. Bradbury? I said, yes. He said, that book of yours, The Martian Chronicles? I said, yes. He says, on page 92, <laughs> he says, where you have the moons of Mars uh, rising in the east? I said, yes. He says, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I hit him. <laughs> Be by <laughs> I was look, at that, look at those young guys up there in that panel. As we got closer to Mars and the dust cleared, we see a lot of Martians standing there with huge signs saying Bradbury was right. <laughs> <laughs> or even Clark. <laughs> uh, so, and I have brought along today, I'm going to keep this short because I'd much rather listen to our scientific friends here today tell us about what's coming up this week. But I, every time I get a group of people together and have them trapped in a hall like this, I bring a poem, see? And you can't escape me. <laughs> Luckily, it's a short poem, but it sums up some of my feelings on why I love space travel, why I write science fiction, why I'm intrigued with what's going on this weekend on Mars. And part of this has my philosophy about space travel in it. And if you'll permit, I'll read it to you. It's very, very short. The fence we walked between the years did balance us serene. It was a place half in the sky where in the green of leaf and promising of peach, we'd reach our hand to touch and almost touch the sky. If we could reach and touch, we said, it would teach us not to never to be dead. We ached and almost touched that stuff. Our reach was never quite enough. If only we had taller been and touched God's cuff, his, his hem, we would not have to go with them who've gone before, who, short as us, stood tall as they could stand and hoped by stretching tall that they might keep their land, their home, their hearth, their flesh and soul. But they, like us, were standing in a hole. Oh, Thomas, Will a race one day stand really tall across the void, across the universe and all, and measured out with rocket fire, at last put Adam's finger forth as on the Sistine ceiling, and God's hand come down the other way to measure man and find him good and gift him with forever's day? I work for that. Short man, large dream, 
I send my rockets forth between my ears, hoping an inch of good is worth a pound of years, aching to hear a voice cry back along the universal mile, we've reached Alpha Centauri, we're tall, oh God, we're tall. Ray concluded that evening um, with something that wasn't on that video um, with some remarks that I think would be absolutely applicable if he was here and, was, uh, and we could say it tonight. Get going to Mars and beyond. The journey is long, the end uncertain, and there is more dark along the way than light, but you can whistle. Come with me by the wall of great tomb yards of all time, which lie a billion years ahead. What shall we whistle as we stroll in our rocket, hoping to make it by the vast darkness where shadows wait to seize and keep us? Here's that gloominess, that darkness again that, he's, that he brings up in so much of his writing, and it's scary. But then he says, and this is the essential, then he says, follow me. I know a tune. Here, listen. And, uh, and that's what I think he, he represented, that optimism will over, overcome all those dangers. Well, it was 1971 when I first saw Ray. It was five years later at the Viking encounter when I first met him. Uh, and he spoke at another Caltech symposium called Why Man Explores. And James Michener, Norman Cousins, Jacques Cousteau, and Phil Morrison joined him on that panel. And it was, again, another one of those uplifting evenings that I think influenced so many of us then, young people in the space program about uh, exploration. And at that event, he said, to be his best and not to be far worse. And Will says what? Stand here, grow tall, rehearse. Be God-grown, man. Act out the universe. There's that stand tall theme again. Well, that was 1975, but it was not until I joined with Carl Sagan and Bruce Murray in 1980 in creating the Planetary Society that I really got to know Ray. Carl and Bruce, of course, knew him well at that point. They'd been on panels with him. They had been socially with him for many, many years. And Ray was one of those people uh, who uh, urged Carl and Bruce, you got to do something about the uh, uh, planetary exploration. You've got to form an organization. Uh, but deal with this terrible dichotomy. The public interest in exploration and planetary exploration in Mars is so great, and the political will is so small. Viking was going to be followed by a, a decade of doing nothing after the glorious 1960s and 70s of planetary exploration. The theater of the solar system was going to go dark in the 1980s. And that's why we formed the Planetary Society. That was the 80s. And that sounds awfully familiar, I'm worried. Because that's what's happening now. That's where we are again. Uh, the, uh, this great mission tonight, there's not another one planned after it. The space program planning for Mars exploration is in total disarray. And I hope something is going to be done about it as a result of, of what's happening tonight. So if I have any message um, from the time we formed the Planetary Society, we formed the Planetary Society to deal with this issue. It's time to form it again. So let's uh, everybody here who isn't a member join, and everybody who is already a member join again, because we're needed now as much as we were in 1980. And, uh, and this is the time that I think we're going to uh, uh, get a renewed interest in planetary exploration as a result of these great missions. Ray joined our board of advisors with others who were urging us to do something about space exploration. Isaac Asimov and Arthur Clarke and many others like James Michener and Norman Cousins and Phil Morrison, who I mentioned were on the panel, and, uh, and even Paul Newman, uh, who was a famous actor at the time, uh, uh, joined with us because everybody wanted to get this planetary exploration uh, program going again. But Ray was not just a name on our letterhead. He kept saying to us, and he often would call me and say, use me. What can I do? 
And we did use him. He lent us his popularity as a worldwide symbol of optimism in the future. Um, Ray joined with Isaac uh, Asimov and, and, and uh, Arthur Clarke, and it was, uh, I was honored actually to work all three with them. And when Isaac Asimov died, um, I came up with this idea that Asimov, Bradbury, Clark, they were the ABC. I, I coined the project ABC to put their works about science fiction up on Mars on the actual, on Mars itself, on a Mars mission. That became Visions of Mars, which uh, Bruce Betts carried out and got to actually implement and put on the Phoenix lander. And now Bradbury's works, along with uh, other science fiction uh, authors, are on Mars. Uh, truly, his book is Martian now. And in some sense, uh, the famous quote that's attributed to Ray, uh, we are the Martians, is, is literally true, except he really never said that. It was the scene he painted at the end of Martian Chronicles that uh, led to the idea that we are the Martians. We had many other notable events with Ray. Uh, Bob Picardo, who is going to follow me up here on the stage, is going to allude to one called An Evening with Ray Bradbury that was uh, over here in the Pasadena Playhouse, and Bob was a principal part of it, along with a couple of other people like Charlton Heston and Michelle Nichols. Uh, we did special showings of Ray's plays in which Ray appeared and, and met with our members in the Playhouse. Um, and perhaps the most fun we did with Ray was having a birthday tribute uh, to him at our old headquarters on Catalina Avenue, and we presented him with what we said was the world's largest birthday card. I don't know if it really was, but we said it was, and nobody contradicted us. We got people, uh, there was something invented early in the 90s, you may have heard of, called the internet, and we got people to sign up for this thing uh, all over the world. It was, uh, and then we printed it out. Uh, uh, it was a lot of fun to present. We also had a little more controversial uh, things we did with Ray. We did an event down at the Pasadena City College uh, with a panel discussion. And Ray had some old-fashioned views. He was kind of annoyed the fact that women, according to him, did not buy his books. <laughs> Apparently, his publisher told him they don't sell to women. So he concluded women don't like science fiction, from which he concluded that women don't care about science. So. Uh, and he kind of expressed those opinions publicly. Well, on the stage that night, we were unlucky enough to have another one of our advisors, who I won't name, but who had some also old-fashioned European ideas about the interest of women in science. And so they got pumping themselves up about the irrelevance of women, and you can imagine. So the people at the PCC audience, they started screaming at him and, and protesting, and we were th thought we were going to have an all-out riot, but Bruce Murray, who was the moderator that evening, stepped up on the stage and somehow managed in his diplomatic way to uh, get everything calmed down. Uh, it was one of our more fun events. I had the privilege of uh, sitting with Ray at a previous Planet Fest uh, when the Mars landing occurred. It was already hard at that point. He was in a wheelchair. It was hard for him to get around. Um, and, uh, but he, couldn't, he didn't want to miss the landing. He didn't want to miss the excitement. So this year, when I visited him last, um, and he was nearly, but not quite, he was nearly bedridden, uh, but he had a sharp mind. He was a good conversationalist. So I said to him, Ray, would it be all right if we came down again and did a little video recording of you at Planet Fest, we know you're not going to get up there, but on August, you know, they're going to have the Mars landing, and, and we'd sure like you to say something to the crowd. Uh, he said, oh, yeah, I want to do that, absolutely. Uh, and we set a date to do that, and very unfortunately, that date was the very week he passed away. Uh, his daughter called me and said, he's in the hospital, can't keep, keep that meeting, and, and then he passed away that same week. So I don't have Ray's greeting on a video recording here to, uh, to play. And I can't deliver what he told me he was going to say in the style that Ray would do it. I'm just, I'm too inhibited. I don't have that, that unbridled enthusiasm, uh, or at least I can't convey it. But here's what he said he was going to say. Hooray! <laughs> Literally, he said that. And about that loud a voice in a small room. So let that be his epitaph. 
at least for us. Hooray, for a future about which we're optimistic and which we help create. Mars beckons, and on it will be determined whether humankind's future is to be a multi-planet and growing species, or whether we will remain hidebound on Earth forever fighting our limits. I think I know what Ray's answer would be about that, and I know it's ours. <laughs>